Don Depler is our guest, and we're talking about the extraterrestrial agenda. Now, Don, just before the break, I had mentioned Behold a Pale Horse by Bill Cooper. And the reason that it's so controversial is that uh, at first, he had a lot of extraterrestrial information, and uh, it really resonates with me. It makes sense. It makes sense that that was the, the plan and the agenda. However, later on in his broadcasting days, towards the very end, he completely flipped. And as a matter of fact, he was attacking Dan in a video that I had heard where he was denouncing all the extraterrestrial stuff. But he, he'd attacked everybody under the sun by the end of his career. So it was hard to take him seriously. It felt like, to me, somebody had got to him and had told him, stop talking about this extraterrestrial stuff. Um, but that's kind of a side issue and beyond the point. The point is that that story really resonated with me. And I'm wondering if you can validate that, um, the idea that we had made an agreement with these extraterrestrials. Actually, I had a very similar experience, and I feel very much the same as you did, and still do. I think that Bill Cooper was not gotten to in the sense that he was scared away. I think he sincerely came to believe that the beings were not extraterrestrial. They might have been ultra-dimensional, but may have even had more spiritually, what is the word? Uh, they were more like demons, and in fact, in some ways... I you could say that they are. But that's simply religious terminology for very much the same phenomenon. Essentially, what I have learned is this, that yes, there were treaty agreements. There were two sets of them, uh, from what I have been told, because there are essentially two factions. Just as everything else in the matrix of Earth life, this reality is built on a, uh, a paradox uh, in much the same way, uh, the extraterrestrial um, reality is also uh, a paradox. We have the good guys, or what they would, what are some call the service to others, who are essentially selfless and have followed a path of cooperation and working together. And these are the origins of the idea that the meek will inherit the earth. And then you have the service to self. These are the ones that have uh, told our leaders, told especially the military leaders and the uh, financial powers that uh, populate Majestic 12 and the Committee of the Majority, what they wanted to hear. So the first treaty that I learned of supposedly was this uh, Greata Treaty, which was supposedly signed uh, before World War II aboard the USS Houston, a cruiser that was taking FDR from the Atlantic to the Pacific. And thanks to modern technology, I've been able to go through all the ship's records and the, the diary, the White House diary, essentially a journal of what happened every day of FDR's presidency. And to be honest, I found no time period, with the exception of approximately half an hour, when this treaty could have been arranged for and conducted. And that half hour would have had to have been when the ship was on the Pacific side and ready to depart for Hawaii. I know these sound like very obscure reference points, but suffice to say, I don't think the Griotta Treaty, as it has been represented, uh, is uh, in actuality a fact. If it was, it was probably done on a different timeline or at a different time than the sources that I've been able to confirm have provided to us. So let's skip ahead to the essential idea that there is or was a crash landing, which I believe took place after the infamous Battle of Los Angeles in February of 1942, when there was a, definitely a large craft of non-earthly proportions, and many people that are, would be listening to the show are probably familiar with that, and that after that event, there was a crash in the Pacific, and a body was recovered, and this body, this extraterrestrial, and or his craft, became the basis of the first um, interaction with the U.S. government, and this led to the development or the organization of what we call the IPU, or what FDR's folks called the Interplanetary Phenomena Unit, and that, of course, was the predecessor to the forerunner for Majestic 12. And that the alien that was recovered at that time 
went by the name or subsequent name of O.H. Krill, or Krill, K-R-L-L-L, there's no vowel. The name was meant to sound guttural and vicious and powerful, but the O.H. was supposedly uh, omnipotent highness, although the black ops personnel involved with maintaining his stay here referred to him as the original hostage, Krill. And I think Bill Cooper even mentions that name in his in his book. I remember and by the that. way, that yes. book was very formative, yes. And that apparently was a real individual. That was a real situation, which uh, sadly for Bill, and I did communicate with Bill shortly before he was assassinated. I was just now beginning to get on the internet at the time and starting to research this, and I mentioned that he had a number of broken links, and of course here I am with a number of broken links on the site that I maintain for Dan, ironically enough. But um, I did have a chance to make contact with Bill, and it was right after that, unfortunately, that he was he was shot. But I do think that he his sources for the O.H. Krill story were were correct, and they have been validated by other sources. However, that's that's the supposedly the bad guys who, once Krill was in communication with the generals and admirals that uh, supposedly had learned of him or were confronted with the reality of him, and I would include uh, MacArthur, General MacArthur, in that, because General MacArthur named Admiral Hillenpetter, who had just lost his battleship, the uh, USS West Virginia, at, in December of 41, and had no command. He named him his uh, chief of intelligence. Now, I put this together from my own research, and I don't know if anybody else has been able to figure this out. But Russ Baker, in his famous book, Family of Secrets, about the Bush dynasty, was able to relate a story of how young George H.W. Bush Sr., Poppy as he's known, was um, rushed off as soon as he landed on the tarmac at Pearl Harbor to a top-secret briefing with Admiral Hillenketter in June of 42, as soon as he had turned 18 and had completed a very rushed period at bombing school so he could uh, go and fight in the war in the Pacific. For some reason, that had to be done very quickly. And this is important because eventually he was the keeper of the secrets and one of the most connected uh, black ops uh, manipulators, uh, uh, humans, really, uh, who had access to all of the information regarding the interactions of the government, and they all led to George Bush eventually, but at the time he was simply an 18-year-old, and I think it was the uh, strings that his father, Prescott Bush, pulled in order to to um, to get him over there and to put him into contact with this krill, and that's where he supposedly learned of what's coming, this pull ship that's coming, and that's why both factions, both the good guys and the bad guys, the Nordics as well as the uh, Greys, and the Greys are allegedly from Zeta Reticuli, and the Nordics are from uh, different galaxies. I have some of them that uh, said they're from Lyra, um, and so forth. Well, Don, hold right there. Let's talk about the pole shift right on the other side and see if they put some kind of date on this event, because I think we might be experiencing it right now. And that's why they're forming breakaway civilizations and making contingency plans. We'll be right back. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, thy whole body is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is full of darkness. Take ye, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness, as you step beyond the veil. Are we experiencing a pole shift right now? Is that why they have made contingency programs, breakaway civilizations, underground bunkers, many different levels? William White Crow, our first hour guest, has disclosed some of that information right here on the broadcast. He'll be joined by Andy Bashago and many other Project Pegasus whistleblowers on August 12th, as well as a new whistleblower coming forward, William White Crow being the latest Project Pegasus whistleblower. But we're speaking with Don Depler about the very subject, uh, about the very possibility of a pole shift. Um, 
Don, it, did they put a date on this? You mentioned in the previous segment that this goes all the way back to Prescott Bush. So the Bush family is very heavily embedded in all of this. The Clintons as well, obviously, because they're in bed with the Bushes. Um, but where are we as far as the timeline goes? No pun intended. Bring to both sides. Now, both sides, uh, the good guys and the bad guys. Remember, the good guys pose as uh, bad guys, not essentially, but to basically say, this is the way it is, you may not like it, but tough. And the bad guys told uh, the Majestic 12 and the government, essentially, uh, well, whatever they wanted to hear, uh, so to allow them to feel more powerful and in control. So they were able to inform uh, Prescott Bush, and this is the one area that I've been trying to research over the past several years, and the information is extremely sparse, and I guess for obvious reasons, but allegedly the uh, Bush family learned of this through their interactions with the uh, Krill, the first alien, uh, during World War II, uh, either immediately prior to it and or right afterwards, because in 1946, uh, not only was... Uh, Bush Jr. Um, uh, birthed, uh, he had a twin and he had to actually, there were supposedly 14 original zygotes. Now, of course, that's according to what I've been told by Nancy Leader, but those 14 zygotes didn't all survive. And the, the movie Boys from Brazil was based on this because, of course, Majestic likes to hide and play and fight and they like to memorialize a lot of their a- aspects of the real reality in popular movies, and they hide these things in there. But at the time, supposedly, uh, Barbara Bush carried not only uh, Bush 43, but another one, and there was a third one that also survived. In fact, there were four that definitely survived for some time. One of them had too much acne and was used during the first Bush term for the radio addresses since the first uh, Bush clone. Uh, the chosen one, as is referred to in the Kitty Kelly book, uh, would often be drunk or high on coke, and that was one of the problems that he had, so they ushered him out. Uh, so that by the second term, uh, the second clone, uh, the worry ward was brought in instead. Um, he had other issues, but we'll, we'll go into that. The, the main important thing is that Prescott Bush in 1946 knew enough about this that he was inspired to and encouraged by some of the beginning technology of uh, zygotes and clones to try to do what he could to see that his family would be in the seat of power at the time of the pole ship because they were told uh, basically the same thing that the other aliens said, which is that the pole shift was going to occur sometime after the new millennium. Shortly after the new millennium is what they were all told by both sides, and the other side uh, told them after Roswell. Now, the bad guys, after that time, after Roswell, there was uh, attempts by both sides to curry favor with Majestic. And Majestic was basically being pulled in both directions, And, of course, that was because the good guys had had to go to the Council of Worlds and essentially say, the bad guys have broken the quarantine, and now they've told the humans about the pole shift, and what can we do to even up the score? Because the soul harvest being as important as it is, you know, we have to have an equal footing there. So they got permission for the Roswell crash. And what we have in a way to fight the efforts of the bad guys is the popularization of technology, which... We have, and as well as Colonel Corso in the day after Roswell details, you know, so, so well. So after Roswell, the bad guys made their treaty and said, well, we'll give you all this hardware. And included in that hardware were nine craft. But it was up to the humans to re, re, uh, reverse engineer them. And this is, of course, why Area 51 S4 has the nine bays. Now, one of them is supposedly empty because it was just too large to be able to haul back there to to the uh, Nevada desert. Um, but we did recover a number of the other ones, and they were given essentially for the humans to, you know, occupy themselves with working uh, to reverse engineer them and so they could be in power at the time of the pole shift. Much of our foreign and domestic policy, in fact, since that period of time, has really revolved around the elite's awareness of this coming pole shift. And, of course, the interstate highway system, when it was first brought in, was a cover for some of the funds 
that were to be used to build these bunkers and these underground cities for the elite. Later on, of course, it was the drugs trade that was uh, part of it, and the oil, uh, the, a lot of the monies that the elite have squandered, they've squandered, uh, along with the monies that have been squandered by the Pentagon and supposedly lost there, were trillions that were essentially used to uh, prepare the elite for the pole shift that was coming up after, shortly after the new millennium. And this is, again, why 2001, uh, the events of 9-11 happened when they did, because that was done for a variety of reasons. As Majestic 12 likes to kill three or four birds with a single stone, one of the purposes of 9-11 was to uh, kick off the continuity of government program, the COG program, whereby these underground facilities were activated and Unfortunately, a lot of humans died after that activation occurred because they had no idea that these very deep dumbs, as uh, your audience knows, deep underground military bases, Richard Souter is the expert on that, uh, these had gases, mysterious gases, uh, that we weren't familiar with, and it just made them un- almost uninhabitable. It coupled with new information that was finally released by aliens of either one or both persuasions, they learned that the tectonic plate shifting would crush most of them, and then they learned that since that was going to happen, most of them would be useless. So the timeline has only been governed if you really want to look at the breadcrumbs to tell us what the timeline is. You almost have to look at the uh, uh, the assignment of extremely large government expenditures for such things as concrete, roads, the building of tunnels and the tunnel boring machines, uh, large foodstuffs that are being trucked into these facilities. You can track those breadcrumbs, literally breadcrumbs, and I don't mean to be, you know, use gallows humor here, but that's that's part of it. So the the timeline as far as uh, when and what month, I'll tell you this much. From what the Burrish... uh, group has explained, what Dan finally um, told his superiors, and his superiors included George H.W. Bush Sr., uh, Kissinger, and the gentleman I referred to as Dadmiral, and that was the first director of national intelligence, uh, John Mike McConnell, or MJ-1, as we learned of him early on in the Burrish saga, and the time frame that Dan was told by Kaila it was to occur on March 28, 2009. And the only connection we have to that date is that the day before was the first noticeable and uh, commonly accepted visual uh, image taken by NASA through Soho or Lasco. I forget, I, I get confused sometimes by all the technical uh, optics that they have. That uh, date showed a winged disc well, Don, you know, it's it's funny you mention that date because we seem to have some major earth changes starting in 2009 and especially through 2011, 2012. We're still seeing them now in 2016, but I have a theory as to what might have happened. I want to get your take right on the other side. of what might have happened between 2009 and the present to change the timeline or change reality. But before I get into that theory, I want you to clear something up for me if you can. You mentioned the soul harvest. Um, Can you explain a little bit what that is? Well, one of the reasons that the pole shift has not been spoken of in public is not merely because of the panic, but because... um, folks that have been given insight into why it is going is going to occur and why it has occurred in the past is because that is essentially uh, the culmination point of our existence or our, our origin and destiny 
here on this planet is we have the temporary use, approximately 79 years on average, of a flesh suit with which we get to play out uh, all the different possibilities that can test and temper um, a soul and the difference between right and wrong. And even though it takes uh, supposedly on average 900 uh, lifetimes, human lifetimes, to develop a massive enough and mature enough of a soul to make a spiritual determination, whether it's going to go with the good guys or the bad guys. In the meantime, approximately 70% of earthlings are undecided because they might be on their 50th lifetime, say, or their 100th lifetime. And many of them during this time will not achieve the uh, the requisite uh, maturity in which to go on to either higher worlds or to come back and, and begin the fourth density reality that supposedly Earth is destined for after one last round of third density uh, beings, what I call the homo reticulans as opposed to homo sapiens that we are now. But the pole shift is the, not every pole shift is a soul harvest, but it's usually the time when almost all of the, the spiritual lessons have we've been taught, are put to the test, and that we've maxed out the temporal experience that these flesh suits could, can experience, and that's the final test in essence. And it is this fact, uh, the fact that we are going to undergo a soul harvest uh, after this, because 90% of humanity is expected um, to, to perish, and most of us in a horrific manner. Yes, there will be about 10% that survive, and it's essential that we all have faith that we might be able to be part of that 10%. Otherwise, the sense of despair and hopelessness would essentially curdle and warp the soul harvest. And the uh, beings that uh, genetic engineers and the soul guardians are the gardeners of this planet, uh, that wouldn't do because uh, there would be no purpose to uh, allowing us to live this reality if there wasn't going to be anything to come from it. Well, let me and throw an whole... idea. I'm sorry. Let me throw an idea out your way. Um, what if the soul harvest has already happened and we're in the next dimension right now? The souls were taken from planet Earth and injected into uh, perhaps an artificial construct as we're being transported somewhere else. Or maybe this is just a new reality in and of itself. But so many people are reporting timeline anomalies, uh, the Mandela effect. I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, but more and more people are aware of a changing environment. The sun isn't what it was when we grew up. Uh, the sun is something completely different. Uh, you have all of these people looking at planet Earth and saying, hey, wait a minute, planet Earth is flat. Not necessarily that I go down that road, but obviously something's changed to the point to where the thinking before is starting to fall apart. The illusion around this is starting to fall apart, and people are starting to question the very foundation of reality, going all the way up to Elon Musk, who stated that there is a one in a billion chance that we're not living in a computer simulation. What do you make of all that? Well, the first thought that came to mind when I first heard of the so-called Flat Earth uh, Theory Version 2, and it all began around December of 2014, and it just came out of the blue. And I knew as soon as it began to gain credence amongst uh, many in the truth-seeking community, at least I'll say that this is my opinion, strictly my humbly defiant opinion, is that it represents but one of the many so-called bean boxes, as Dan Burrish referred to them. These bean boxes, each one of them, contain some kernels and elements of the truth, but they were designed to keep the entire uh, group of black ops employees and so forth that each had to do something to reverse engineer or to study uh, extraterrestrial or extrasensory phenomenon, these bean boxes kept them all separated, and they each had a different paradigm. And part of these, the job of these paradigms is that when the time came, each one of them would play a leading role in what is known to me as Operation Patchwork, which is to allow a little bit of the truth out amongst the truth-seeking community. So some of them would run with it and say, I have the truth here. This is what it's all about, and this, and this is what's going to happen. And unfortunately, uh, they may have missed something, but they, they need to be aware that they might be just part of this Operation Patchwork. And I feel that the, the Flat Earth Theory was designed to show how 
the very same arguments that many in the truth-seeking community, the research community, use in order to understand and to double-check and to mollify their own skepticism uh, can use to to make sure that they're not being led down a primrose path. Unfortunately, it was used to their own, uh, not not demise, but to uh, to bamboozle them, which is uh, the whole idea of, of keeping us bamboozled and to keep us from waking up too fast. This is what first came to mind when I heard about the flat earth theory. Now, it is a real phenomenon when you talk about the Mandela effect and the timeline anomalies and Here's what I attribute a lot of that to because I experience it as well. And I've had to reflect as I'm experiencing it. Is this something real or am I simply being distracted in one way? It's because we are being distracted as much as possible. The speed of our thoughts and of our reality uh, has been increasing such that uh, our communications with each other as humans has escalated to such a rapid uh, speed that it not only are we getting a form of jet lag, uh, we're, we're getting uh, G-force of, I, I'm only using that term to express the idea that uh, the speed is, is causing uh, some complications with the way that we register our reality. Yes, we still eat food, but yes, we're also changing physically in how we look. But on the other hand, if you look at the uh, waves of fashion, there's, there's almost no uh, trends that uh, they would create a trend in fashion, whether, whether it be clothing or food or design or uh, music or whatever. Now it's almost like one big hodgepodge, and there's just slivers of every imaginable kind. But the essential idea is that uh, much of this is simply – the uh, sociological changes that are associated, as uh, in Zeta Talk explains some of this, not that they're the only source, but they do go into this, that these sociological changes are going to uh, modify our behavior because we are at the mercy, not at the mercy, but rather we're being uh, inspired and encouraged and manipulated by spiritual forces, some of which we are too weak to repel, and some of which are designed to help us, like Tesla responded uh, to the inspiration that gave him alternating current. Well, all of us are experiencing much of that same kind of thing, but on a much smaller level. Uh, there's not that many versions of the alternating current that we can improve upon right now. Uh, we're just simply getting our electronics much uh, smaller, more miniaturized uh, to a micro size, but I don't necessarily believe that all of these, um, like the flat earth or the Mandela effect, uh, there are other ones coming also. But they're designed to, on the one hand, distract us. And I was told, too, that much of the burrish saga, before I even set down that road, I had a friend work for the Department of Energy, and he gave me a briefing on what to expect if I was going to pursue looking into the matter. And he said, that's a distraction. There was going to be a lot more of them before we get to that point because you have four billion or seven billion people lumbering about the planet, bellowing like bulls in a china shop if they're told too early what to expect. That is very true, Don. Stay right there. Hour number three coming up. And on the topic of flat earth, um, the first thing that came to mind is how did tens of thousands of people all of a sudden wake up with half their brains missing one day. I've got to look into it. I found that there was some valid information, but you're right. There was a lot of information that was missing, but I think it was a great stepping stone, at least to question the very foundation of reality. And we'll do that in hour number three with Don Depler, ladies and gentlemen, right here on Beyond the Veil. Phase two complete. Preparing to initiate phase three momentarily. Brace yourself, traveler. We are about to venture into the realms of the unknown. www.beyondthevailradio.com You are listening to the True Truth Truth Frequency Radio Network. No hate, no hype, no, 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 no fear. T minus 60 seconds and counting.
Welcome, fellow traveler, to phase three of this journey. Here you will experience an even deeper level of understanding as we traverse through the boundaries of hyperspace consciousness. Here, you will find that reality is altered with a single thought and a single intention. Set your intention now and prepare to travel deeper. Deeper, deeper, deeper. Beyond the veil. Maybe this all this is all part of the integration. And so we've been put into this space as we begin to learn more. And once the consciousness ascends, then we're ready for fourth density existence. Some of us are already feeling it right now. Um, some of us are experienced the, experiencing the fourth density consciousness. Some of it is happening in waves. Some people have been able to achieve it um, most of the time but others simply are not. And maybe this is the test right here. Don Depler is our guest, and we're talking about extraterrestrial contact, the Mandela effect, and much, much more. Don, where does Project Looking Glass and Stargate come play into all of this? I'm glad you uh, mentioned that. Project Looking Glass is one of the projects that Dan Burrish had introduced us to, and it revolves around a device which is essentially a method of looking into the future, or allegedly looking into the future. And if uh, members in the audience have ever seen that movie Paycheck by with Ben Affleck starring in the role, uh, that actually was based in large measure on elements of the Burrish saga. Everything from the number of his apartment as the number of the train and even when they do a close-up at the end of the destruction of the uh, laboratory and then you see a uh, lotus petal sitting with a wristwatch. Uh, the whole thing is just replete with symbolism that revolves around the, the entire Burr story. But when, at the laboratory in the top secret spaces, Ben Affleck gains admission to uh, this room where they have what looks like a, a standard type of, of round television screen and it's images of the future. And he essentially sees a, a number or lottery ticket, a winning lottery ticket number uh, and the date. And he uses that information. He essentially uh, gets rid of all of the uh, things that were in his, his little bag when he agreed to take on the project. And when he agreed to take it on, he was injected with some type of a, a device. And then when he left the project, they erased his memory. I, I remember but, that film. I, I saw it a long time ago. I think I'm going to watch that this evening, though. Oh, I would highly recommend it. it I actually bought it on DVD, and I try to watch it. Um, I think I'm up to my fifth time now, because there's always something new to discover in it, and it really does uh, make you think about this possibility. Well, in The Looking Glass, let me first describe it uh, as I described it when I was a uh, guest on William Shatner's uh, TV series, uh, Weird or What, this device, as it was explained to me, was uh, 12 feet in diameter, and I think it was 60 feet long, and it involved uh, what I consider smoke and mirrors, or what they call uh, gases and lenses, same thing using a variety of different types of gases that were shot through like lasers into this large glass, uh, like a window, uh, through these different lenses, it was supposedly able to show an image of the future at a certain time, but it was never explained as to the vantage point of where this took place. Now, there were two halves of each of these looking glass uh, devices, and there was two of them. According to what Dan told me, there was one set that was in India and another set that was there in Nevada. And uh, because the members of the committee of majority were getting addicted to these views of the future, they, it was like a hard drug. It was like cocaine. They dismantled it because uh, the possibilities of what it could do. Uh, there's an old, uh, and starring William Shatner too, by the way, ironically enough, Twilight Zone episode where uh, William Shatner and his newlywed bride stop at um, 
a little diner. Right. I remember and that. And they one. have this. Right. There's a little uh, a machine like a jukebox, and they ask it questions. Uh, what's going to happen at three o'clock or whatever? And it would answer them, and he gets really addicted. He has to know the next thing. And of course, the answer could mean at least one of two different things. Now, as Dan explained it in one example, I'll give one example that that he used. He was told by um, MJ1, what we all call Jay, who I called Dadmore after that, that his wife, his then wife, Deb, Deb Burrish, was going to break her ankle in two weeks' time. And this was in early 2005. Now, in two weeks' time, Dan already knew that he was supposed to be going to Cabrillo Bay with Deb Burrish, his wife, and with his Marsha McDowell and the other majestic folks, and they were going to uh, basically put the Ganesh particles into the Bay of Los Angeles, uh, Cabrillo Bay, and clean it up of, of all the uh, dirt and medical sludge, whatever, and make it pristine again. So anyway, they go there. Uh, the point of the story, though, is that he was thinking to himself, well, I can't tell her because if I tell her, it's going to magnify what's going to happen. It's going to make it 10 times as bad. If I tell her what's supposed to be happening to her, she's going to avoid it, and then something else will happen that's 10 times worse. So Dadmiral had told Dan, well, you know that you can't tell your wife about this. And Dan then didn't say anything. But then the evening came before they were to go, and they... Uh, it turns out, yeah, Deb Burst tell, tell, turns to Dan and says, you know, I, I can't go. I have to go to the local school. We have to, our daughter's having a PTA. She got in trouble. I really have to go and see the teacher about this. So Dan's relieved, thinking, oh, well, that's not going to happen then, because a lot of things never, you know, ended up not happening, even though the looking glass would tell them. And also it said that this is going to occur at um, 10 miles south of whatever, some latitude. As it turns out, uh, she stayed at Las Vegas, and she went to the parent-teacher conference. She went into the classroom, tripped over the carpet threshold, and sprained her ankle. And so it did. She she had to go to the hospital, but she didn't break it. Uh, so Dan thought, well, she's not going to be with us. Isn't gonna, nothing's going to happen. And, of course, that did happen. So was it because Looking Glass told them, or just was that a coincidence? Now, here's how I understand that it could have happened very easily. From the relationship that Majestic had with the one group of aliens that the bad guys who pose as the good guys, they have access to a computerized, some very sophisticated technology that can extrapolate about a week or two weeks at the most in advance and can tell the future. And they use that, they parley that information because they know that 99.99% of all humans on Earth are going to happen. They're going to do things in a predetermined way that you can, just like Google can tell you when you're going to be going to McDonald's and even pop up with a coupon. Hey, here's a coupon because we know you're going to be stopping at McDonald's today. And of course, you feel like having Google know that. There was a software that we discussed, I want to say it was the Promise software, located at a facility called P-Tech, and this was a topic back in 2009 on the show that predicted every scenario based on all of the data that's being fed into this machine and the scenario that they were putting in, uh, judged the public's reaction. I'm wondering if you're talking about the same thing. We'll be right back. Planar consciousness may be acting in, both we and the things belonging to the planar, for the time being, are only realities. However, if we mistake the shadows for realities, we find ourselves confusing the upward progress of the ego, as an elevation of consciousness. Thus, beware of oneself, when you step beyond the veil.
As I mentioned before the break, back in 2009, I think it was one of the first shows that we did here at TFR, we were speaking on the topic of a software, and if I remember correctly, it was called the Promise Software. And this software took all of the information um, that is available on the internet and uh, all of mankind and fed it into a machine. And I think that that's what all these cameras are ultimately for. They're um, tracking all the movements, all the reactions. Uh, that's why we've got microphones listening to everything we say. It's not necessarily a spy program in the sense that somebody's actually listening to you, but rather all of this information is being fed into what ultimately is artificial reality. I mean, artificial intelligence. So this this uh, software is located in a place called P-Tech. And the context in which we were speaking of was government false flags and operations. If they were to do a 9-11, for instance, how would the public react? What would the outcome be? Feeding it into this machine gives them a pretty spot-on analysis of uh, and a prediction of the future. And so, Don, you mentioned a similar type of machine or software, and I'm wondering if there's any connection between the two. Well, I'm not exactly certain, but I did want to uh, make the connection with what I was just talking about before the break with the other prediction that is worthy of note, and that's because it's extremely important since Hillary Clinton is running for president again, and many people cannot understand how it is that she seems to be getting away with quite a bit on the part of the establishment and the power structure. And they may be interested in hearing that in 2008, when she was first running for president, and this had been in the planning stage, just like they had planned to put in George Jr. Uh, in the seat of power at the turn of the millennium so that he would be in position at the time they were told by the other group of aliens that was going to happen. They wanted to make sure they were in power. Well, Hillary is part of that whole Tweedledee, Tweedledum, we're going to toss the presidency between us so that we're going to be in control during this entire time period. And that way we can benefit because we'll be in power after the shift and we'll control all things and everything. So the looking glass had shown an image of both Benazir Bhutto uh, becoming president of Pakistan, uh, and that was a female, and also Hillary Clinton becoming president of the United States. And it was during that campaign that you may remember an ad in which Hillary and Bill are sitting at a little lunch counter. And again, there's a little machine, like the little jukebox that's on the end of the table. And it showed the label of the 45 that was playing, and the song was Brandy. And if you know your music history from the 70s, you know that the name of the band that played, played the song Brandy was called Looking Glass. And for a brief second, that name and that image flashed across as just one more incidence, incident uh, or instance of letting the common man know, letting the public data stream know uh, of what was known to be coming, that the looking glass predicted that the two of them sitting in front of that little jukebox, a former president, would be joined by his wife, an incoming president. And, of course, after she lost to Barack Obama, who was presaged by the other group of Zetas to become president, because he supposedly carried the soul of Lincoln, that they said, well, maybe those aliens are right, so they all caved in and all supported Barack Obama by acclamation. Well, it occurred to many of them that maybe, just like the story that Dan had given me about his wife back at Cabrillo Bay, that maybe, just maybe, this looking glass was correct, but it wasn't correct about 2008. It was correct about 2016. So they never know when this could be occurring, but it would be occurring anyway. And this is why, supposedly why, some have, have um, speculated that this is why a lot of the establishment have become so robot-like and obedient and not doing any thing to get in the way of Madam President. So having said that, because I wanted to get that out before I forgot about it, uh, and then uh, swivel back to the P-TECH claim. The Promise software that I know of goes all the way back to the Octopus and Danny Costellaro, and I'm not that familiar with P-TECH and the claims that were made as to what P-TECH was going to use, but I, I know of a vague rumblings about the uh, the use of some of these bean boxes where they were going to 
uh, institute an environment of TIA, Total Information Awareness, so that they could essentially, like you said, artificial intelligence use total information awareness to for predictive uh, of almost any scenario and have a, a reactive plan ready for it. That's as much as I can tell you about that. Um, now, if you refresh uh, my memory of what you were making a connection to P-TECH uh, just a few it, moments before. It was a software that basically predicts the future. Um, based on uh, all of the information that's being fed into this artificial intelligence brain, essentially. And I think that's what the whole surveillance state is all about, is, is um, TIA, feeding. Totally TIA, exactly. Where? That's exactly what it is. Yeah, that was definitely part of their program, and they said about, in fact, Facebook is part of that, and this is one of the reasons why uh, Zuckerberg uh, supposedly was uh, favored, because... Uh, what did Facebook do that MySpace hadn't already attempted to achieve before it? Well, they got a lot of backing, just like certain movies get a lot of backing, uh, because it fits into their plan. And in this plan, it's uh, for total information awareness. In 2005, before YouTube and Facebook had even taken off, they were talking about doing this, and they even mentioned, I, did, I was given access to a transcript of a conversation between the director of national intelligence in which he was referring to total information awareness and its connection to Facebook in which Facebook would uh, essentially do what we were doing. Our little group was simply a group of average people from all different walks of life and all different corners of the globe. Uh, that was our consciousness was connected to each other and we were friends. So they were able to see how we were thinking about some of these concepts uh, that they were trying to essentially sell to us. Well, Facebook emerged as it, it was just a mega steroid forum in which they could examine every human and everything that they uh, would want it to be, their thoughts, their happinesses, their their sadnesses, uh, and their plots and their schemes. Uh, they could uh, they could see it all in action and develop a predictive type of software. Promise was the company that also developed the back door into the Justice Department software, So, that, and then they sold that to other countries, and that's why they were able to compromise other governments so easily after Reagan came in. So if Promise is the same company that's developing this new software that you're speaking of, that would fit perfectly and precisely into this plan. I think it's one and the same um, and Facebook is very interesting in and of itself. You couldn't spy on a population in the capacity that people are volunteering the information on Facebook, for instance. They say where they go, what they're eating, uh, who their friends are, their locations, their thoughts. And they've even done experimentations on Facebook, too, by manipulating people's timelines to try to change their moods and see how they can better manipulate people. Facebook is one letter away from casebook a casebook obviously is a dossier on a suspect that the fbi uses it's all connected right there and we're volunteering all of this information that's what makes it even worse we'll be right back don depler is our guest right here on beyond the veil